Hello all. Unless you have already done your component for coursework for your A-level, this may be the first time that you are coming to the new territory of having to apply other critical opinions. Assessment Objective 5 is explore literary texts informed by different interpretations. And what I want to look at here is how you meaningfully engage with those other critical interpretations. This will be really valuable in terms of exam technique and preparation, so please hit the like button, please subscribe, hit the notification bell for other exam preparation episodes moving forward, and do um, share elsewhere if it's possible. Thank you. Bringing in other critical interpretations is a really tough skill set. Frankly, it's not something that was demanded of me at A-level. It is something I consider an undergraduate university level skill set. But you are challenged to do it. And it's not simply a case of remembering what some other critics said and regurgitating them. That won't get you better than a D grade. In Assessment Objective 5, you must ensure that critical interpretations are quoted and that you cite who said them, but that's D grade at best. You've got to engage with them. You might do that in support of them. You might refute or refine that interpretation rather than merely quote and collate to show off that you've remembered some. Basically, how the scoring and levelling works, I don't want to put this too bluntly so that you think that each band equates to a grade. It, it doesn't technically work like that. Although, actually, if you think about the numerics of how it adds up, it, it sort of maps onto things that way. In the bottom band, where you are essentially using little to no critics, you're in E grade at best, if that. Um, it's easy to memorise a few critics. Uh, some, stand, some, some candidates won't even meet that standard, unfortunately. Um, it's easy to show off you've memorised a few critics, uh, but if all you do is memorise a few critical quotes and say, Sue Rogers said such and such and I agree, or Sue makes a very good point that blah de blah that's just too easy. That's likely to be band to degrade at best. Not that you would be quoting somebody by their Christian name anyway, you'd be using their surname. You must also cite that you are drawing on others' words. So you are quoting them literally within quotations or paraphrasing them, but with an acknowledgement. So if you're quoting their ideas or their words directly, by making at least a bracketed acknowledgement or reference, uh, bracket their name at the very least, or introduce them by name. Ideally, a direct quotation that you go on to do something with. I personally teach my students to actually do footnotes in the academic university level style for their component for coursework, but that's not feasible in the time constraints of the exam, so just bracket is fine. Uh, bracketing your citations tends to be more of a science discipline way of doing it. Footnoting tends to be what the arts and English departments do in order to improve the flow of essays. Um, however, bracketing a brief acknowledgement in the exam will do. You must, though, be citing the name of the critic, otherwise you're effectively plagiarising. So, just quoting them in support or agreement because you like the idea, that's a good starting point, but it's degrade. What are valuable ways of extending reading of other critics in your exam responses? I think there's something of a hierarchy or scale to it, whereby in band two, you've remembered some, you've quoted some, you've linked it to the text, uh, you've agreed, you've done a, a good job, it's a good start, 
but it's not enough. Let's see how we climb that scale. We're aiming to get to the top of that scale for A star. If you neglect to quote any critics whatsoever, you will be an E if you're lucky. The first and most basic thing required is that you show an understanding of the other critics interpretation and what they're putting forward about the play. That's pretty basic. It's a necessary starting point but it's only band 2 D grade approximately. You are supporting your ideas but you're only doing so by making a straightforward explanation of a, a fairly generic alternative interpretation. You might be agreeing with the point made. Of course, by all means do that. You will use plenty of critics throughout your response to do that. But to leave it at that, across all of the critics you've selected, and there should be several, isn't enough. You need, in order to be starting to sink your teeth into that critic further, to identify further evidence in the play to extend that interpretation. If you're in agreement with it, that's absolutely fine, but if you just say, critic such and such said blah de blah and I agree, or you know, I'm being a bit facetious there by clunkily using the phrase and I agree, that isn't showing that you have applied the critic to the text. Go away and find a quotation or aspect of the text that you think evidences that idea and explain that that is why you agree with them. You're taking it a step further. You're then moving beyond merely copying the critic's idea um, before the critic did the work of selecting a quotation and stating an interpretation and you just agreed. Fine, it's a good start, but by selecting further evidence elsewhere in the play to back it up, you are starting to what the Mark scheme calls explore other interpretations with a clear understanding that should be approximately C grade in band 3. Please don't think that I am saying that band 2 is D, band 3 is C. It is not exactly like that, but year on year the boundaries typically map on in roughly that way. Uh, normally toward the top of a band. Um, things have been a bit more generous over the last couple of years, but I am taking a conservative approach for safety's sake. You might, in that middle band, start to draw contrasting views as well as supporting ones, but uh, we'll look at that in a bit further detail as we move up the scale. I really do think, without doing so arrogantly, that you need to be finding ways to disagree with a critic's position. Not too generically. Don't tell me that an early 19th century or an early 20th century critic is being racist and leave it at that. They might be, but explore it with further evidence so that you're engaging with that analytically. Uh, there might be a misogynistic attitude that you want to disagree with. By all means, do so, but you can't simply naively apply your 21st century social opinion to a critic of hundreds of years ago if you don't also go on to cite evidence within the play for why you think that. For example, you might argue with a critic who is saying that Desdemona is passive. That's fine but cite some evidence of how she is not passive elsewhere in the play, arguing against her father or pursuing Cassio's cause with Othello, for example. Um, you might talk about critics who seem to come over as racist or we think are racist, but cite evidence for other motivations within the play, for example. Don't do it too generically. However, it's important that you do find ways to refine the position of a critic at least. 
in a more nuanced way, or counter-argue and disagree with them. Identify evidence in the play to support your opposing argument. For me, that really shifts up a gear into engaging with Assessment Objective 5 more analytically, more meaningfully, in greater depth. At the risk of droning on too long, I want to repeat and inculcate this idea. You have quoted critics and you have cited their names. You have found evidence elsewhere in the play to support those interpretations. That is not enough until you are engaging with and starting to refine those critical interpretations with your own. Another way in which you might do this is to compare the critic's position with your own reading of the text and find evidence of your own from elsewhere in the play. Or you might pit one critic against another identify any connections, contrasts, differences between the two that might be quite subtle and nuanced and argue which one of them you're more or less persuaded by according to connecting with your evidence from elsewhere lifted from the drama. With a good range of critical quotations from Shakespeare's time because one way that you can do this for comparing and contrasting and one way that you can do this for disagreeing and pitting one against another is that you might quote criticism from the time of Shakespeare himself several hundred years ago to a critic from the early 1900s a hundred and a bit years ago to something more contemporary to ourselves. The 50s will be very different from the 90s or 2000s. Um, there are interpretations therefore, especially on racial or gender themes, that can be easier to take on, but do be nuanced rather than naively generic, as I've forewarned earlier on. Beyond that, you might seek to refine the critic's position by identifying an element that you support, but another aspect that you wish to refine, that you want to slightly adjust and qualify that with your independent choice of evidence, either from that scene that the critic's talking about or elsewhere within the play. Select particular critical quotations that support or contrast with your reading to strengthen the discussion within your essay and exam answer. This use of supporting and contrasting views to your own allows you to refute with evidence in order to what the Mark Scheme calls develop an exploration of different interpretations, integrating them in a controlled discussion of your own critical position. That should be moving you through A grade, uh, oh, excuse me, through B grade and into A grade in band four. And if you've got a broad enough range of critics and you are sustaining that in what the Mark Scheme calls an evaluative approach, Band 5, A, A star. Evaluation should be about you really refuting and uh, refining those critical interpretations. To evaluate a text, let's call it a text because that's what we're analysing here, whether it's a play or not, means, according to the exam board, that you are interrogating the potential multiple meanings of quotations, the different ways in which um, connections can be made. The best responses will 
integrate the assessment objectives together. They'll be synthesised in a good argument. Your argument needs to show a comprehensive understanding of the play and maintain a focus on the question throughout the whole essay. Your analysis needs to develop your overall argument. Socio-historic context needs to be integrated fluently. There's no point regurgitating historic remembrances and knowledge if it's not analytically integrated. So, um, you need to think about integrating AO3, but your AO1 argument needs to be well integrated with AO5 and AO2. Craft a good introduction and conclusion. So, evaluation means interrogating multiple possible interpretations of a text. Here, sustained evaluation for band 5 means that you are interrogating multiple interpretations of a scene or a line or a bit of dialogue with a critic alongside other critics alongside your interpretation and finding evidence to contrast and support and that needs to be handled in an integrated way as a core part of your AO1 argument and ideally that needs to be informed analytically by the AO3 socio-historics that are analytically relevant to things like racial themes, ideas about Christianity, East meets West, the medieval chain of being, etc. that we will go into greater detail on when we revise, not today, um, just so that you have an idea of how to build these together. You cannot treat AO1, AO2, AO3 and AO5 as separate entities. They must be integrated for an A star response. So if you're yet to make a leap into other critics' opinions, the exam board's tragedy critical anthology is the starting point. You might have looked at it with your teacher already, you might not. However, I want to give a health warning on this, that it should be treated merely as a springboard, a starting point for ideas. It is not anywhere near enough to just use this anthology alone. There's not that much in it. It breaks my heart when I see exam answers from candidates that only quote a couple of things from only this anthology. You've got to go a lot further. There are four sections. Uh, no, they're not. There are five sections. Sections A to E in this. You only need A and E. Section A contains four critical extracts, pretty generically, on the concept of Shakespearean tragedy, uh, including A.C. Bradley from the early 1900s, who comes up a lot in quoting about Othello. Section E is on Othello. Ignore the sections in the middle because you're not doing those plays. And don't be the spanner who accidentally answers on the wrong play in the exam. Every year for mocks, especially at GCSE, I give that warning and somebody does. And then every year somebody different does again in the real thing. I see EAJ Honingman quoted an, a lot in exam responses. Fine if that's a starting point, but it's a red flag to me if I don't see some other names besides the critical anthology. Uh, in his introduction to Othello, uh, first published 91 and then reprinted 2001, he talks of Samuel Johnson and A.C. Bradley's hatred of Iago, contrasting this with the view of Charles Lamb. While we read any of Shakespeare's great criminal characters, 
we think not so much of the crimes they commit as of the ambition, the aspiring spirit, the intellectual activity which prompts them to overleap these moral fences. Sadism allows him to bask in his sense of his own superiority. He's talking here about a core theme of ambition and whether actually we enjoy colluding with Iago in opposition to Bradley and Samuel Johnson, um, who was the um, inventor of the uh, first dictionary. Um, so we might find ourselves agreeing, but how do we engage with a critic rather than simply quoting or citing them? Just as a quick example, you might perhaps explore whether, whilst we do judge Iago morally, uh, we might quote from the play an aspect of his misogyny, the motives that he alleges, his jealousy, his suspicion, albeit erroneously it seems, of cuckoldry, we could refine that by quoting aspects of the play in which the structure, the monologues, the soliloquies, prompt an audience to somewhat enjoy complicity with his plotting. Just an idea. F. R. Leavis is an early 20th century critic who comes up a great deal when looking at Othello. Um, in his Diabolic Intellect and the Noble Hero of 1937, Diabolic, remember, uh, Diabolical of the Devil, Hell, Othello has discovered his mistake, but there is no tragic self-discovery. We might engage with Leavis by looking at what extent we, as an audience member, sympathise with Othello. Is he a tragic victim or an engineer of his own fate? Um, you could argue that he realises he's been duped up to a point by Iago, but he still goes into an angry rage and tries to justify it. Oh, she was foul. Um, does he? have an agnorisis? Does he make a tragic self-discovery? Um, he realises there's an error, but does he really psychologically change? It's a subjective query that we can't really fully answer, but it's a way of engaging with and refining. Uh, I think I'd be inclined to agree with Leavis, but you can really sustain your evaluation of that with your use of evidence from the play. Annie Alumba is a 20th and 21st century critic, uh, usually on the topic of race. Othello and the racial question. I see Lumba quoted uh, over and again in exam responses, and for good reason, because it's really useful stuff with which um, students would be inclined to agree, and so would I. But, as with Honigman, I don't want to just see names from the critical anthology. Iago's machinations, uh, mach the machinery of the wrongdoing that he undertakes, are effective because Othello is predisposed to believing his pronouncements and the inherent duplicity of women and the necessary fragility of an unnatural relationship between a young, white, well-born woman and an older black soldier. Ideologies work because they are not entirely external to us. Othello is a victim of racial beliefs precisely because he becomes an agent of misogynistic ones. I really rate this as um, something that I would concur with, especially looking at the way that um, other critics, as we'll come to later in this presentation, look at whether, for Othello, the enemy is within the gates. Not that Iago is incredibly clever, 
but that he manipulates psychology already in Othello, where he is racist in reference to himself. His self-referential racism, whereby he feels a lack of confidence in psychologically viewing himself through the eyes and lens of white Venetian society. Rather than simply conferring, how are we going to engage? I really want you to stick this in your mind. Obsequious is one thing that I want you to go armed with. Engagement with critics is another. I like this example of not simply using a 21st century lens to label the play racist. Is it a racist play? Or does it explore racism? And I'd like to give Shakespeare the benefit of the doubt, especially how how much he presents Othello in a different way to Aaron in Titus, that he does seem to present views, especially views of women, in a way that might contrast the contemporary patriarchy of his time, potentially. Here, Lumber argues about both attitudes to gender and race, but is not the only critic to draw a nuanced distinction that Othello's self-referential view is inherently bound within a Venetian society's racism. He goes from confidently and eloquently defending his wooing of Desdemona, falsely self-deprecating, pretending to self-criticise to seem humble, with rude my my speech, to a loss of confidence in Desdemona's faithfulness and fidelity that he immediately associates with, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers, uh, that people in the palaces of Venetian aristocracy have, and that he is declined into the veil, the valley of years of old age. I think that's one that you could really sustain a more critical engagement with. It's uh, something of a, a silver bullet. I would challenge you to go away and really spend a long time sitting down with some university level, longer pieces of critical engagement, chapters of journals, if your teacher can provide them. But there's no feasible or reasonable way that I can publish such a thing under copyright terms. So I'm going to just take a paragraph or two at most from things like that. Strategies then with which you might engage with critics. I've got some um, statements here that I must um, acknowledge my indebtedness to the EMC for. Um, that are generic statements about the play rather than citing actual critics. But this serves as an introductory exercise that forces you to engage. I want you to go about this by reading one and verbally responding. In fact, you might hit pause to take a look at these. I want you to read one and then, even if it's terribly awkward and tumbleweedy, Read it into the mirror, do it with a mate, do it in class. Um, you can only respond verbally to the critic on the spot after a few seconds thinking time by starting your response either yes and or yes but. So, for example, uh, jealousy may be at the heart of the tragedy, but it is not Othello's floor alone. Uh, Felicity, give us your response. And even if it's awkward for a few seconds and you've got to just have some time to think, yes, and develop your response, or yes, but, and develop your response. The first, yes and, requires you to find further evidence within the play to back the interpretation up. It's the easier starting point. The second, yes, but, is not a disagreement because you have still said yes, but, 
you are going on to refine that position. First by finding further evidence of your own within the play, or, and, then, by expanding to perhaps refute and refine the point, even by pitting one critic against another. Yes and, yes but. Jealousy may be at the heart of the tragedy, but it is not Othello's flaw alone. Could you yes but refine that and say, yeah, Othello is guilty of jealousy, but so is Iago and so is Rodrigo and find other evidence there. Of course, you're not just doing this with the mindset of I am doing AO5 and I must refute a critic or I must refine a critic. Yes, you must, but you can only start talking about jealousy or Rodrigo or Yargo's jealousy over alleged cuckoldry, if it's suitable to the question that you've had. A play of willful blindness. Yes, and aren't we frustrated by Othello? Why does he never ask? A tragedy about the power of words and the power of silence. I'm doing this in real time off the top of my head. Yes, it's about the power of Iago's leaving words unsaid to manipulate, but only in a contemporary context of misogyny and racism and expand with further evidence. The audience leave tainted not cleansed. Yes, and we are made complicit with Yargo's plots. A study in evil. Yes, and Yargo is the true Machiavellian villain. The best villain in lit. Gullibility, not jealousy, is the flaw. Yes, and uh, Othello is led tenderly by the nose as asses are. He thinks all men honest. That's simply done. Yes, but uh, jealousy is an important part of a play that centres around many sexual, racial and gendered themes. I could go on and explore that obviously in far greater detail. Uh, ambition, loyalty, disloyalty, obsequious sycophancy, all of these things come in. Othello fulfills few of Aristotle's precepts, but we still recognise the play as tragic. Um, I think talking about Aristotle and Greek tragedy is actually not particularly that valuable analytically. Um, does it take place over the unity of time? No. The unity of place? No. Um, but the tragic hero characteristics very much align. I would try to economically bring in your Greek tragedy terminology, Hamartia, hubris, peripatia, anagnorisis, catharsis, where analytically relevant, not simply to feature spot. A play of too many motives. Yes, but surely the multiple motives are a core characteristic of Iago's duplicity. In this play, we are forced to collude with the villain. Yes, and I agree, because that's my favourite uh, angle from which to come at this play. The terrible power of language, something very similar to a tragedy about the power of words and the power of silence. Okay, 
do that exercise for yourself. Hit pause for me, for me and take as long as you like for each of them. Five, four, three, two, one. Once you've done that, I want you to keep yes and yes but in your mind at all times. Not to always literally do yes and and yes but because that becomes clunky. But it's a good mental exercise that I then want you to go on to apply to snippets of all critics' interpretations throughout anything that you come across. Yes and, yes but... F. R. Levis, Diabolic Intellect and the Noble Hero. Uh, Scrutiny is, I assume, a academic journal, published December 1937. Don't worry about citing dates within your exam, you haven't time. Uh, just bracket F. R. Levis or Levis. We should see in Yargo's prompt success not so much Yargo's diabolic intellect, devilish intelligence, as Othello's readiness to respond. Yargo's power, in fact, in the temptation scene, is that he represents something that is in Othello, the husband of Desdemona. The traitor is within the gates, both in terms of self-referential racism, fought his way out of slavery, to be valued by white society as a warrior when white society is mercantile and more modern. Trade, East meets West in Venice. And in a society where the woman is possession and a white wife. The traitor is within the gates, yes, and his self-referential racism is manipulated by Iago. Sean McAvoy, Shakespeare the Basics, 2000. The audience becomes complicit in Iago's intention. I've stolen the complicity term from McAvoy. And, like it or not, is soon involved in his vengeful plotting. He actually asks them what he should do in his soliloquies. Many actors who have played the part have been capable of getting members of the audience to share Yargo's delight in his powers of evil invention. Could you link that with Levis's remark on the traitor being within the gates? If I could play any character on stage, it would be Yargo. Or with a close second being narrating Blood Brothers. Crane, the prose of the play, Shakespeare's prose. Don't worry about citing the title. Just be able to bracket Crane. Don't worry about the whole name. Just concentrate on the surname. Don't be a modern misogynist who, when it's a female critic, cites the whole name versus citing only the surname for a man. There's a subtle misogyny to that. That I'm trying to eradicate. Iago dominates most of the prose in Othello. It is one manifestation and a very important one of the character Iago has created as a disguise for himself. Honest Iago speaks in verse to the other characters apart from with Rodrigo. He falls into prose at times with him and he falls into prose when he's speaking in soliloquies for the audience's purpose of plotting, evil doings. So prose is a manifestation of a character that has disguised himself as honest Iago. But prose is not Iago's true language. Whenever he is alone, he drops into the verse of the Machiavellian villain. I think that confuses things slightly. Be careful. I'm not saying that he always speaks in prose when he's in a soliloquy. Uh, it's a mixture of both. Um, but make sure that you make analytical meaning of it. Uh, I do 
want to caveat with a health warning that my students have tended to muddle this somewhat in responses. Remember, yes and, yes but. Pit one critic against another. Find further evidence from the play and evaluate the multiple possible interpretations of the text whereby you say which you are more or less convinced by than the other. Gardner. He is monstrous because, faced with the manifold richness of experience, his only reaction is calculation and the desire to manipulate. Ultimately, whatever its proximate motives, malice is motiveless. Uh, Coleridge, a poet, but also a Shakespearean critic, uh, talks about Iago as a motiveless malignity, um, like a cancerous tumour. If a, a cancerous tumour in a literal sense is benign, it, it's well, if a tumour is benign, it's not cancerous, it's not growing and it's not causing harm. Uh, a malignant tumour is cancerous and will replicate and spread. Malice is motiveless, says Gardner. That is the secret of its power and its horror. Why it can go unsuspected and why its revelation always shocks. You will notice there that I have quoted Gardner, not Snyder. If you're unfamiliar, because there's no reason as an A-level student without wishing to patronise that you should be at this stage, um, the critical essay or uh, chapter, The Noble Moor, is in a collection or book of essays edited by Snyder. So here you'd be quoting Gardner. Pit one against the other. Uh, remember how I described what the exam board calls being evaluative. To evaluate a text means to interrogate the potential multiple meanings of quotations. The different ways in which you can make connections to texts. To consider the significance of contexts and to present a critical argument which asserts a point of view about the text in relation to the question that you've been given. That epitomises a brilliant argument. So, to evaluate from one critic to the next, which you are more or less convinced by because of the evidence you've got from the play. So, let's pit Gardner against Smith. That Iago gives no substantive motive for his actions, or rather that he proposes so many reasons and so casually that they fail to convince, I'd be inclined to agree there. I think that's part of his duplicity. And that he remains alive and mutely defiant at the play's conclusion adds to the unsettling effect. Unlike the figure Shakespeare inherited from his source material, who admits he acts because he is himself in love with Desdemona, Iago's opacity has prompted one of the play's most insistent questions. While he reveals to us his attitudes right from the opening lines, unlike the characters within the fiction, the audience is under no illusions about the ironically dubbed Honest Iago. He never reveals himself. He refuses at the end to even speak. I'm going to let you engage with these critics and evaluate to what extent you're convinced and why. Yes and, yes but. It will be a long and laborious road, but another vital thing that you need to do to engage with critics is to find evidence throughout Acts 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 
to support or contrast views. Here are some on Othello as a character. A.C. Bradley from the early 1900s. Othello's nature is all of one piece. His trust, where he trusts, is absolute. Hesitation is almost impossible to him. He's extremely self-reliant and decides and acts instantaneously. If stirred to indignation, he answers with one lightning stroke. Love, if he loves, must be to him the heaven where either he must live or bear no life. If such a passion as jealousy seizes, it will swell into a well-nigh incontrollable flood. He's full of passionate rage. F. R. Leavis is writing in the 1930s, about 30 years after the, the 1900s, the 19 singles of Bradley. He really is, beyond any question, the nobly massive man of action, the captain of men. He seems, sees himself as being, in short, a habit of self-approving, self dramatization playing the role of masculine warrior that white Venetian society has so valued to get him out of slavery in the first place, to get him away from cannibals and anthropophagi, makes him a sort of self-posturing, mentally ill man. His self dramatization is an essential element in Othello's makeup. I really like that Liebes quotation. McAvoy, um, much more contemporary, the 2000s. Othello's tragedy is that he lives according to a set of stories through which he interprets the world. He has wooed Desdemona this way, an ideology, but that is a world that has been superseded. He cannot see that this is so, and the contradictions within his ideology destroy him. He is living the life of a chivalric, gosh, get my teeth in, um, chivalric warrior in a world run by money and self-interest. He is outdated in Venice. Critics' interpretations of Iago. Cogill. Psychologically, Iago is a slighted man powerfully possessed by hatred against a master who, as he thinks, has kept him down, and by envy for a man he despises who has been promoted over him. I think that's fairly obvious, isn't it? I'm not sure that's that useful. Gardner. He's monstrous because, faced with the manifold richness of experience, his only reaction is calculation and the desire to manipulate. Ultimately, whatever its proximate motives, malice is motiveless. That is the secret of its power and its horror, why it can go unsuspected, and why its revelation always shocks. Greer. Uh, Jermaine Greer is a, a feminist critic who um, likes to say incendiary, inflammatory things and get people riled up. Uh, a quality that I enjoy. We no longer feel, as Shakespeare's contemporaries did, uh, the, the time of Shakespeare's writing, the ubiquity of Satan in a, a growingly secular society. But Iago is still serviceable to us as an objective correlative to the mindless inventiveness of racist aggression. Yargo is still alive and kicking and filling migrants' letterboxes with excrement. Um, he, she here is talking about the emotional power of the racist themes being as, as pertinent in today's society as then. Uh, we're repeating ourselves with Gardner and McAvoy, but they're, they're useful ones that I think are good. The audience becomes complicit in Yargo's intention and, like it or not, is soon involved in his vengeful plotting. He actually asks them, the audience, what he should do. Many actors who've played the part have been capable of getting members of the audience to share Yargo's delight 
in his own powers of evil invention. So as I've constantly used this term complicity with Yargo's plotting, I am stealing McAvoy's point without um, citing him. Perhaps that's plagiaristic of me. Uh, don't do the same in your exam responses. Bracket him. The health warning that I've given you a number of times already is that I don't want you to take a naively generic, ooh, the time was really racist, or ooh, it was very sexist. But that said, we can use it up to a point, and as long as we develop that in a more evaluative, sustained way. One quite straightforward way that you might take on critics to refute them, to contrast, to argue with them, to counter-argue, might be by their position due to their time period versus social development since. Albeit we, we mustn't be arrogant about assuming the times are no longer racist or the times are no longer sexist. However, that can be useful particularly in relation to gender and racial attitudes. Um, Desdemona portrayals of Desdemona. The modern day audience has found Desdemona's utter submissiveness, I would refute that, in the face of severe provocation rather frustrating. However, it's also argued that her behaviour might have been regarded by some people in the past as exemplary for a married woman. How would you act if you were a woman forced, uh, faced excuse me, with similar circumstance? Put your wedding sheets on the bed and hope for the best? Or pack up your bags and slam a few doors on the way out? Look particularly at the precise social constraints operating on Desdemona. What options are realistically open to her in the society in which she lives? I agree. I would also re refine it by caveating that she breaks with social convention by eloping with a black man, disobeying her father, and confidently asserts her position in regard to fairness to Cassio with her husband. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is a well-known poet, here critiquing the play in the 19th century. He was a romantic with a capital R poet. Coleridge was intrigued by the character of Iago, and whose activities he described as arising out of motiveless malignity. Um, a benign tumour causing no harm, a malignant tumour being cancerous. Is Coleridge right in his assessment? Um, a, a colleague that I once met on a course described Iago as an emotional vandal which I thought was a fantastic way of um, using a metaphor for it. He also expresses the view of Othello that it would be something monstrous to conceive that this beautiful Venetian girl falling in love with a veritable Negro, we wouldn't use the Negro term now, uh, and we might refute Coleridge's racial perspective there, whilst being careful not to just naively say, oh, this is racist and I don't agree. We've got to think about showing our awareness, perhaps, of the Elizabethan and Jacobean lens of Shakespeare's time in relation to um, the alien concept of black people in England or white society and the association with witchcraft, lack of Christianity and evil to, excuse me, give her a more nuanced and subtle layered approach. Bradley, writing in 1904, writes about Othello's ethnic origins. He takes great pains to prove that Othello would have been Arabic in appearance. Perhaps if we saw Othello coal black with the bodily eye, the aversion of our blood would overpower our imagination. He is actually being nuanced there in talking about the idea of a blackamoor um, of Arabic descent versus somebody of darker 
um, uh, uh, African black. Um, Levis, writing in the 50s, um, he wrote over many decades from the 30s as well, um, ascribes voluptuous sensuality and sensual possessiveness and appetite to Othello and comments that the stuff of which he is made begins to deteriorate and show itself unfit. Um, oh, is Levis there actually associating being black with lasciviousness? It, it's, uh, it's unclear. Rhymer, um, in the 1600s, argues that the moral of Othello is as a caution of all maidens of quality, how, without their parents' consent, they run away with blackamoors. It's a warning against a well-bred aristocratic white woman not to run away with a black man. He continues by drawing parallels between 17th century England and the imagined state of Venice. With us, a blackamoor might rise to be a trumpeter, an entertainer. With us, a moor might marry some little drab or small coal wench. Certainly never was any play fraught like this of Othello with improbabilities. Uh, a black person marrying a white woman would be unheard of at this time. He also draws assumptions about the lack of moral fortitude within Venice, where the anti the the, the non-Christian world collides with Christianity. Use AO3 to meaningfully analyse, in your AO1 argument, the AO5 critical interpretations. Don't just say it was racist. Refine and refute the layers. Be nuanced and sophisticated in your argument. Bailey. No one in Othello comes to understand himself or anyone else. Perhaps you might engage with that by thinking about whether you consider Othello to suffer or to experience anagnorisis, self-realisation, or not, toward the end of Act 5. Hapgood and Maguire argue that Othello should have been more rational and empirical could you engage with that by talking about your potential frustration with the fact that he doesn't apply more logic to it? Nevo. The views of Othello fall into two camps. An ideal lover, if anything too noble, too trusting, and at heart incorruptible, and, on the other view, is that he is a windbag, a posturer, an egotistical self-deceiver, an immature romantic, not in love with a real woman, but with his idealised fantasy of a woman. In reality, a person of sensual and vindictive nature, whose overriding need is to think well of himself a braggart soldier, incapable of dealing with the challenges of peace and mature personal relationships. In short, a balloon of self-esteem which can be exploded with a prick. She herself argues that Othello is a warrior first and a lover secondarily. Is Desdemona a trophy wife to him for status. Do they fall in love with each other as others? Does he idealise the white woman? And does she romanticise and idealise the black warrior who, whereby she falls in love with his stories of daring do? These idealised things 
are they actually more in love with the idea of love than in love with the individual as a genuine relationship, especially in the case of Othello? Is he in love with the idea of love rather than Desdemona? That might be one way to engage and refine that point with further evidence of your own from the play. Cohen. The character of Iago is a variation on the vice figure found in early morality plays, early Greek morality plays and tragedies commented upon morally by the Greek chorus. He deviates from this model because of his lack of clear motivation and because of his portrayal as a very malignant figure. However, Iago is less of a character than a changeable device for the plot. And in this sense, he is a clear descendant of the omnipresent vice figure. Iago's great cunning, manipulative abilities and almost supernatural perception mean that he is a very formidable foe. And this makes Othello's fall seem even more inevitable and tragic. President John Quincy Adams in the 1800s, I know that I've said just quote somebody's um, site in brackets, somebody's surname, but perhaps we should point out that he was the president of the US, in his essay argues that Desdemona should not have disobeyed her father by acting independently. For the modern audience, this enables them to see her as an active and independent force. Today, we can celebrate the qualities in Desdemona that Adams condemns. He also argues that her passion for Othello is unnatural, solely and exclusively because of his colour, and that her marriage to him shows her disregard for filial duty. The moral of the play for Adams is that the marriage between black and white is ill-assorted, clandestine and unnatural, and will end in tragedy. Um, I believe this is... Oh, I don't know whether that... Is that Samuel Johnson or not? I'm not sure. Johnson, in the 18th century, writes about Desdemona. He comments on her soft simplicity, innocence and artlessness. Maybe there's not much to go out there. There's not enough of it. Jones argues that Othello faces a dilemma of vulnerability because of his marriage, i.e. black marrying white, causes critical public reaction. He also argues that Brabantio, in his opposition to the marriage, reflects popular prejudice of the time. This is somebody in the 40s looking back to that period. Neely writes that the play develops out of the oppositions of attitudes, viewpoints and sexes. Snyder argues that Brabantio, Iago and finally Othello see the love between Othello and Desdemona as unnatural, as nature erring from itself. Is that one of Iago's motivations? Bailey, 1962. Two different kinds of love are movingly displayed here. Othello's is the masculine and romantic. His opening hyperbole invokes the romantic commonplace, love calls to war, and also receives Desdemona into his holy martial personality, just as she had wished in refusing to remain a moth of peace. The glory of the achievement is carried buoyantly on in the image of the ship riding the waves. What battles and dangers wouldn't they undergo for this? But then, with the imagined calm, a note of brooding appears. The tone changes and deepens. If twere now to die, Othello has withdrawn his delighted gaze from Desdemona and is addressing himself and his own vision of love. In love with the idea of love? 
And in the romantic context, that vision has an alarming familiarity. Having achieved his desire, Othello turns naturally to the idea of Liebstod, death as the only fit and comparable peer of love. How can the tension otherwise be kept up and the lover remain at the summit of his happiness? Unknowingly, Othello is applying this fatal romantic logic. Ryan, 1989. In loving and marrying each other, Othello and Desdemona instinctively act according to principles of racial equality and sexual freedom, which are still not normative, still far from generally accepted and practised even in our modern day, let alone in Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's tragic protagonists are all overpowered by the prevailing social and ideological tides which sweep them unawares out of their depth, rather than by some metaphysically predestined misfortune or by some flaw, whether culpable, haphazard or innate in the composition of their characters. It's not, argues Ryan, the Renaissance concept of something being fated in the stars. It's not something where we apply an Aristotelian tragic fatal flaw. It's about, he thinks, racial attitudes that are still not common today. In our white society, how many people do we know that are in interracial relationships, for example? Uh, we've already looked at Greer previously, um, but this is a slightly more fleshed out version. This is Greer writing in 1986, a very, very good year. The action of Othello opens out to include the audience and their perception of the struggle of good and evil. They do not go home hoping they will never meet a Iago, but rather understanding something of the nature of evil and how soon bright things come to confusion. The ethical notion of evil as defective, absurd and inconsistent is Aristotelian, but the embodiment of these characteristics in an agent, a character who is acting them as a plot device, what we said with one of the critics earlier, which makes possible the dynamic presentation of evil as an active force, is Christian. We no longer feel, as Shakespeare's contemporaries did, the ubiquity of Satan in a secular society where more people have become less religious, but Iago is still serviceable to us as an objective correlative of the mindless inventiveness of racist aggression. Iago is still alive and kicking and filling migrants' letterboxes with excrement. She likes uh, an incendiary inflammatory flourish, does Greer. Uh, we've already had some of Levis from the 50s, but I think this one is fleshed out further as well. Othello, in his magnanimous way, is egotistic. He really is, beyond any question, the nobly massive man of action, the captain of men that he sees himself as being but he does very much see himself. Keep up your bright swords, for the dew will rust them. In short, a habit of self-approving self dramatization is an essential element in Othello's makeup. He must project his value as warrior to this society that uses him. It is, at the best, the impressive manifestation of a noble egotism, but, in the new marital situation, this egotism isn't going to be the less dangerous for its nobility. Is what I'm arguing there actually a way to subtly refute, or not refute, but refine Levis' position? Yes, he does have a self-approving self dramatization but is it actually to project and promote his value to a society that would otherwise not value him? That could be a really good way of engaging. <laughs> 
This self-centeredness doesn't mean self-knowledge. We could argue he does not experience anagnorisis. That is a virtue which Othello, a soldier of fortune, hasn't much need of. He doesn't realise, although he realises he's been duped, he still tries to justify what he did. He is not repentant. And in knowing that, his suicide alone will ensure that he doesn't ascend to heaven. Scrag, writing in the 60s. Two very influential critics rejected Bradley's analysis of the hero. In these readings, Othello emerges as a weak and inadequate figure. T.S. Eliot, in Shakespeare and the Stoicism of Seneca, 1927, accused Othello of self dramatization Focusing on his last speech, he says that the Moor is guilty of trying to cheer himself up as he attempts to evade reality. The antithesis, the opposite of anagnorisis? Levis seems to be borrowing um, Eliot's earlier use of self dramatization as a phrase. For Eliot, his speech is a terrible exposure of human weakness. Levis, in Diabolic Intellect of the Noble Hero, 1952, also rejected Bradley's reading of Othello's character. He argued that the tragic protagonist was responsible for his own downfall. Iago's role is subordinate and merely ancillary, secondary. Levis claims that Iago has a propensity of jealousy and possesses a weak character which is sorely tested by marriage. The stuff of which he's made begins at once to deteriorate and show itself unfit. Othello's love is dismissed. It is composed very largely, according to Levis, of ignorance of self as well as ignorance of Desdemona. Othello emerges as ferociously stupid in Levis's reading. So far as Iago is concerned, Levis feels that he displays a not uncommon kind of grudging malice and has enough of a grievance to explain his motivation. The Bradley-Levis debate has continued with commentators exploring Othello's flaws and nobility and arguing about whether Iago is motiveless evil personified or simply a sour subordinate with petty but adequate motives for revenge. Some critics question whether Iago understands his own motivations. Since the 50s, there have been a number of suggestions that Iago is driven by latent homosexuality. We will look at uh, this queer theory perspective later. Hazlitt's view of the villain has been extended so that Iago is now considered an example of the typical stage Machiavellian who personifies rationality, self-interest, hypocrisy, cunning, expediency, the efficient policy, he is an amoral artist who seeks to fashion a world in his own image. Let's think about evaluating critics here. If we return to Levis, evaluation is about asserting your position and arguing the nuances of multiple possible interpretations. If we just re return to Levis here, where he's making an argument that on the one hand, Othello is in the habit of self-promoting his value to white Venetian society as a warrior and thus never reaches anagnorisis or a self-awareness, is that contrary 
to leave us his other position of the enemy being within the gates, i.e. a self-referential racism. Could you evaluate which of those nuances you're more compelled by, for example? Bradley, 1904. Othello does not belong to our world. He's alien. And he seems to enter it, we know not whence, almost as if from Wonderland. There is something mysterious in his descent from men of royal siege, in his wanderings in vast deserts and among marvellous peoples, in his tales of magic handkerchiefs and prophetic sibyls, in the sudden vague glimpses we get of numberless battles and sieges in which he has played the hero and has borne a charmed life. Even in chance references to his baptism, his being sold to slavery, his sojourn, his um, brief trip away as though a quick holiday in Aleppo somewhere uh, formidable with enemies, being deliberately downplayed by Bradley here, romanticising the idea, the idealised black. And he is not merely a romantic figure. His own nature is romantic. So he comes before us, dark and grand, with a light upon him from the sun where he was born. Bradley reads the tragic hero as somebody uh, being a, a romanticised man of colour. We might have looked a bit at Gardner already. Among the tragedies of Shakespeare, Othello is supreme in one quality. Beauty. Much of its poetry, in imagery, perfection of phrase and steadiness of rhythm, soaring yet firm, enchants the sensuous imagination. Othello is like a hero of the ancient world, in that he is not a man like us, but a man recognised as extraordinary. He seems born to do great deeds and live in legend. He has the heroic capacity for passion, but the thing which most sets him apart is his solitariness. He is a stranger, a man of alien race, without ties of nature or natural duties. He is, in a sense, a self-made man, the product of a certain kind of life which he has chosen to lead. I'm not sure how useful that one is, but Bradley there, I think, could be used to, uh, in a subtle way, counter-argue racist readings, perhaps. But in a way that refines a more analytically nuanced approach about romanticising the other don't just label it racist. He talks about uh, each of Desdemona and Othello romanticising the other there, the concept of othering somebody in a way that seems exotic. Racial attitudes now, as opposed to the way that they're depicted within the world of the play, are explored here in various critical quotations from the 1980s, 90s and 2000s. Belsey. Critics might be interested in the historical difference between our own perceptions of blackness and those of Shakespeare's early audiences. The play was the product of a society already fascinated by travellers' tales of distant cultures and beginning to be interested in the mercantile possibilities of colonial conquest, getting monetary gain from these other countries. Some of this appears in Othello's stories of cannibals and men with shoulders above their heads, as well as the references to his own captivity and sail into slavery. We should, perhaps, Remember that Africans enslaved each other at this time, as well as being victims of the European slave trade. There's a nuanced point to make. Imperial values developed a mythology of white civilization and black barbarity, which readily mapped 
onto an existing system of differences, familiar from Christianity on the one hand and secular love poetry on the other, between what was fair, light-skinned, beautiful and good, and all that was dark, ugly and evil. Cowhig. Only as we recognise the familiarity of the figure of the black man as villain in Elizabethan drama can we appreciate what must have been the startling impact on Shakespeare's audience of a black hero of outstanding qualities in his play Othello, very different from Aaron the Moor, evil character in Titus Andronicus, his first play. Inevitably, we are forced to ask questions which we cannot satisfactorily answer. Why did Shakespeare choose a black man as the hero of one of his great tragedies? What experience led the dramatist who had portrayed the conventional stereotype in Aaron in 1590 in Titus Andronicus to break completely with tradition ten years later? Had Shakespeare any direct contact with black people? Why did he select the tale of Othello from the large number of Italian stories available to him? Uh, on Capitano Moro being the, the, the Italian play that he borrowed from, uh, from, I think, the 11th century, if I recall. Briggs, Africans, Jews and Strangers in the stage play world. Elizabeth's edicts suggest that her society discriminated against people with different colour skin in the same way that many societies still do today. The point that most of them are infidels, non-Christians, having no understanding of Christ or his gospel appears as something of an afterthought in the 1601 proclamation. If you think of Elizabeth, she was heavily daubed with lead-based, poisonous, white um, makeup, if you will, uh, and it was not fashionable to even have a tan. If you were a worker in the fields, you were tanned and therefore poverty-stricken. You would go out with a parasol. Elizabeth famously only had about one annual bath and then took a week to recover from the dangers of it. As a colour, blackness was associated with the devil, evil doing and death. And from the mid-16th century, it reflected a new awareness of visible difference by acquiring aesthetic overtones as the antithesis of fair, which had traditionally been more highly valued and more fashionable than dark skin, since it was already a measure of status. Only the privileged could afford to avoid sunburn and the darkening of the skin that resulted from labour out of doors. But now, difference of skin colour was defined in terms that rated pale European skins above darker complexions in terms of religion and Christianity, morality. Cowhig, Blacks in Early English Renaissance Drama and the Role of Shakespeare's Othello in The Black Presence in English Literature. Yargo's destructive cruelty has seemed to many characters to be inadequately motivated. They have spoken of motiveless malignity and diabolic intellect, sometimes considering Iago to be the most interesting character in the play. I think I tend to agree. I think, however, this is an unbalanced view, resulting from the failure to recognise racial issues. Iago's contempt for Othello, despite his grudging recognition of his qualities, his jealousy over Cassio's preferment, and the gnawing hatred which drives him on are based on arrogant racism. He harps mercilessly upon the unnaturalness of the marriage between Othello and Desdemona. The exclamation of disgust and the words smell and foul reveal a phobia so obvious 
that it is strange that it is often passed over. The attack demolishes Othello's defences because this kind of racial contempt exposes his basic insecurity as an alien in a white society. Fintan O'Toole. Shakespeare is hard, but so is life. The most obvious thing about Othello has also been, in the way that the play has been taught and interpreted, the least obvious. Othello is black, but Othello, a man who engages our sympathies more immediately and more directly than any other Shakespearean tragic protagonist, could not, in a long tradition of criticism of the play, possibly be black. How could a black man be so noble, so engaging, so obviously capable of such delicacy of feeling? There are two ways of dealing with this. One is to deny that Othello's blackness has anything much to do with the play. The other, by the vehemence with which it insists that Othello could not really be played as black on the stage, disproves the first, showing by its very racism the centrality of the colour of Othello's skin to the play as a whole. It would, of course, be equally outrageous to see Othello as a play about racism in a modern sense. Shakespeare's England was not a multiracial society or the centre of a multiracial empire as it would later become. There's O'Toole demonstrating the kind of nuance and balance that I want you to strike here. At the same time, though, Shakespeare was certainly conscious of race. We can't reduce it to just, oh, it's much more racist than it is now. If there was no large black population in his England, there were significant numbers of black people, significant enough for Queen Elizabeth to complain in 1601 of being discontented at the great number of negars and blackamoors which are crept into the realm. That brings us back to episode one on socio-historic context. And we know that Shakespeare was aware of the fear, revulsion and sexual disgust which blackness could invoke in a contemporary audience because he used it quite frequently. Portia in The Merchant of Venice is glad to be rid of the Prince of Morocco and all of his complexion. The King of Naples in The Tempest is criticised for having married his daughter to the King of Tunis, even though the court had pleaded with him not to loose her to an African, let her loose, as well as lose being spelt with one O. Hamlet talks of his mother's desire to batten on this moor, a pun in which moor is used as the opposite of fair. Aaron the moor, in Titus Andronicus, is an atheist and inhuman dog. He in, um, implicates two innocent people in a crime and is ultimately punished to starve to death, buried to his neck. What's unusual about Othello, then, is not that it uses racial antagonisms, but the attitude it adopts toward them. For if, in Titus Andronicus, it is the Moor who is an inhuman dog, in Othello it is not the Moor, but his tormentor Iago, who is described as an inhuman dog by Act 5. The important thing, indeed the crucial thing for an understanding of what happens in the play though, is that this racism isn't just the context in which Othello lives. It has entered his mind and his soul. The enemy within the gates, as one critic puts it, self-referential racism as I have put it, it is an integral part of him 
a piece of the outside world which he carries around in his most intimate, private self. It is the connection between the world around him and his thoughts, desires and feelings. Iago is able to influence Othello not because Othello is stupid or because he carries jealousy like an original sin stamped on his soul, but because Iago makes this connection. Iago's brilliance lies not in what he puts into Othello's mind, but what he draws out of it. He takes what is already there and gives it a local habitation and a name, takes shame and doubt and gives them visible substance. For heaven's sake, use O'Toole. Um, it might not be something that you're refuting, but I think this is something that you can really engage with in a, a sustained way. In a similar way to the theme of racism, gender, women, portrayals of women, misogyny, patriarchy, might be a way for you to refute critics across various different periods. These, however, are critics talking uh, in the 90s, so they, they should, we hope, be more contemporaneous. Jardine, 1996, why should he call her whore? quotes Amelia's defence of Desdemona and what Othello has said to, unbeknownst to her, her husband Iago, who's responsible for it. So, critics on women and Desdemona. In Othello, three women of three distinct social ranks figure prominently in the plot. Desdemona is the daughter of one of Venice's most senior and influential citizens. Bianca is a Venetian courtesan, a woman of substance who supports herself and her household by her liaisons with men of rank, notably Cassio, Othello's second in command. I've referred to her as a prostitute. It's not quite the same thing. Or is that a euphemism? Amelia is the wife of Othello's third in command, Iago, and personal maid to Desdemona. As women playing active roles within the community, the three are occupationally distinct. They are very different in social status. All three are wrongfully accused of sexual misdemeanour in the course of the play. All three, though unequal in their rank power, are equally vulnerable to a sexual charge brought against them. Have I been inadvertently or unknowingly um, sexist in, in assuming prostitution in Bianca? I may be guilty. Although the incidents which provoke the slander may be presumed to be of separate and distinct types, as befits the differing social situations in which the three women find themselves, they yield the identical slur, the identical charge of sexual promiscuity, the most readily available form of assault on a woman's reputation. The woman rendered whore, where a man with this behaviour might be praised as some sort of stud or player. Don't use either of those terms too colloquial in an essay. But there is a, a patriarchal misogyny in the differing dynamic. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. Each takes the accusation, once made, extremely seriously. But the ways these accusations are dealt with by the women themselves have very different consequences. And this is crucial. To understand what happens in Othello... I shall argue it is important to distinguish an offensive remark or gesture, the kind which remains all too accessible and current from what was once an indictable offence, but one which, as an integral part of the system of social relations of the early modern period, we no longer recognise.' 
it does not just matter that a woman is called whore, it matters when and where she is, with what audience. In Othello, the crisis point in the play's presentation of Desdemona comes in Act 4, Scene 2, when Othello publicly defames Desdemona and Amelia repeats and circulates the defamation, uh, un unintendedly reinforcing and confirming it. The seriousness of the incident is explicit, in strong contrast to the earlier easy, casual impugning of Desdemona's honesty among the male figures in the play, in private and in her absence, just locker room talk between each other. Jardine argues, from this point on, Desdemona's case is entirely altered because what in private might be an insult, once made public, becomes defamation of character. Desdemona has been publicly designated whore in terms damaging enough to constitute a substantial threat to her reputation, a core theme, not just Cassio's reputation, Othello's reputation, Desdemona's reputation is the pivotal topic of this play. Even when the defamation is erroneous and deliberately false, a sophism. From this point on, there is no casual innuendo, no lewd comment on Othello's wife's behaviour or supposed sexual appetite. Desdemona's two remaining scenes focus now on her supposedly culpable sexuality, culminating in her suffocation on her bed in a state of undress. A whore's death for all her innocence. I want to suggest that if we allow a historical reading to direct us towards substantial defamation as the crux of the plot in Othello, then we are also led toward a revised reading of the instrumentality of Othello's jealousy. Another core theme. But don't clunkily label a theme a theme, just analyse it, bring it in. I suggest that once the substantial defamation stands against Desdemona, Othello murders her for adultery not out of jealousy, or is it about his status, to refine Jardine's point, why I call her a whore, of Othello's status of having been cuckolded, a diminishing of his possessive masculinity, having not sexually satisfied? Critics threw time on women and Desdemona that, in some cases by their archaic position, their outdated old-fashioned position, we might more easily refute, so long as we don't do so in a naively generic way. The soft simplicity of Desdemona, confident of merit and conscious of innocence, her artless perseverance in her suit and her slowness to suspect that she can be suspected are such signs of Shakespeare's skill in human nature as, I suppose, it is vain to seek in any modern writer. A.W. Schlegel, angelic, an offering without blemish, full of simplicity, softness and humility. She seems calculated to form the most yielding and tender wife. Siddons on acting the part of Desdemona in the 1800s. You've no idea how the innocence and playful simplicity of my Desdemona have laid hold on the hearts of people. Jameson. Desdemona displays at times a transient energy arising from the power of affection, but gentleness gives the prevailing tone to her character. Gentleness in its excess, gentleness verging on passiveness, gentleness which not only cannot resent, but cannot resist. <laughs>
some positive interpretations of her there in the 17 and 1800s that perhaps oversimplify her. John Quincy Adams, the lady is a little less than a wanton. Who can sympathise with Desdemona? She falls in love and makes a runaway match with a blackamoor for no better reason than that he has told her a braggart story. For this, she not only violates her duties to her father, her family, her sex and her country, but she makes the first advances. Desdemona has been false to the purity of her sex and condition when she married Othello. While compassionating her melancholy fate, we cannot forget the vice of her character. It's her fault. Who, in real life, would have her for a sister, daughter or wife? Herod, in the 1800s, she has a habit of fibbing. She's a liar. She lies about the handkerchief. Practically, too, she dallies with falsehood. I am not merry, but I do beguile the thing I am by seeming otherwise. To seem otherwise than she is, in order to obtain her end, is at all times lawful in her estimation. He thinks that she deserves it because she fibs. Turnbull, an earthly paragon. Bradley, ardent with the courage and idealism of a saint. Desdemona is helplessly passive. I think we can refute that one. She can do nothing whatever. She cannot retaliate even in speech. No, not even in silent feeling. I think that you can refute critics saying that she is passive by citing her marriage to Othello against Brabantio's wishes and the way that she persists and asserts her position in defence of Cassio to Othello, whilst at the same time taking a subtle and nuanced, balanced approach in talking about the way that the time period she lived in required an obedience to husband. It's not passivity that we perceive in a 21st century perspective. Also Bradley, more exquisitely painful, she is helpless because her nature is infinitely sweet and her love absolute. Pay attention to the dates. You don't need to cite exact dates, but when you cite a critic, if you can indicate their period, that might help you in your engaging with refining or refuting them. Rosenberg in the 60s. She's been called too gentle and too passive. More recently, a basic contradiction has been seen in her, supposed to involve a British softness and modesty and an unassimilated Italianate sophistication and aggressiveness. Nickel, her characteristic lack of self-respect and tendency toward concealing truth by prevarication. Is that nervousness, though, about her husband's aggression? Sam Mendes, whose name you'll know as a famed director, uh, you might know him as the director of some of the Bond films, as well as many other things, um, produced uh, a performance, a production of the play in the 90s. Desdemona made a very specific decision to marry this man. It seems to be extraordinary for someone, even now, to creep out of the house at 10 o'clock at night and go down the road and marry a black general without her father knowing. I would be aligned with Mendes in talking about this as being the opposite of passivity. You could pitch Mendes against uh, a character or a critic that says that she is passive, um, such as uh, Schlegel or... Um, sort of quoting Rosenberg, although he's not actually arguing she is passive. Some of these earlier critics. So that's the main thing I had in my mind about the character when he was preparing a production and, and casting and directing. You want someone with the courage of her convictions and the presence of mind to make that decision. 
She does deceive Othello because she knows the handkerchief is lost and doesn't say so. You can't just play her as passive as a modern actress when she does what she does early in the play. There's got to be nuance. Characters have to be dynamic and change throughout a performance. Otherwise, what's the point in an audience watching? It would be boring. She knows the handkerchief is lost and doesn't say so, and that's a big mistake. It's a small lie, but in terms of the story, it's big. And, of course, Iago confronts Othello with the single most important piece of information psychologically about Desdemona, which is that she has tricked her father. If she can do that to her father, a very rich grandee, she can do it to Othello. And Othello can't deny that. Two incontestable pieces of information. He knows, she knows the handkerchief is missing. And he knows she betrayed her father. That makes her in some ways extremely strong. An active participant in the drama rather than an insipid, feeble girl. I, if I were analysing in a question on Desdemona, would align myself with Mendes here, quote him, agree with him, find evidence, and then pit him against a critic from a much earlier period describing her as passive. For example, you might talk about the fact that um, Mendes acknowledges that she does lie about the handkerchief and that that's a big mistake because it's the crux at which Othello truly no longer believes her fidelity in anything, even though it's a small lie. You could, at that point, pit Mendes against Herod at the top of that slide and the fact that he seems to really overemphasize the scale of her lies and their sinfulness. Racial attitudes in the world depicted. I am, you'll note, mostly concentrating on critical opinions on gender and race. This is from Marilyn French's Shakespeare's Division of Experience. Um, racial attitudes in, in the time of the play. Othello's values are those of aristocratic Venice. Iago's are those of its underside. Iago has contempt for the feminine principle for women and feeling and sex. Othello, without his awareness, shares this contempt. The first clue to this is his behaviour in the Senate chamber. Othello swears that as truly as to heaven I do confess the vices of my blood, so justly to your grave ears I'll present how I did thrive in this fair lady's love. The comparison seems inept, but Othello is never inept. Unconsciously, he is associating love with vice. In his effort to persuade the Senate that his commission will take priority over his marriage, he uses terms that could be Yargo's. If he neglects his work for love, he says, let housewives make a skillet of my helm. In response to the order to leave immediately before the consummation of his marriage, he says with all my heart, he accepts the commission for Cyprus with a natural and prompt alacrity. He seems to have no regret whatever about leaving Desdemona. When she demurs and asks to go with him, he seconds her, but assures the Senate that he wants her not to please the palate of his sexual appetite, but to be free and bounteous to her mind. We might assume from this that Othello has a weakness or undemanding sensual nature indeed. One critic has so concluded. But this is the same man who later tells Desdemona she is 
so lovely fair, and smellst so sweet, that the sense aches at thee. Some critics uh, query whether they actually ever get the opportunity to consummate the marriage. Othello's denial of the erotic element in love is related to Iago's denial of the loving elements in Eros. Uh, or Eros, I'm not sure about the, the pronunciation there. Both denials emerge from a need to separate love, the in-law aspect, from sex, the outlaw. Both attempt to control sexuality, Othello by idealising it, Iago by demeaning it, a happiness to their sheets. But we have reason to control our raging motions, our carnal stings, our unbitted, our bited lusts, excuse me, whereof I take this that you call love to be a sect or scion. Both men assume that love and lust are related. Othello tries to purify the lustfulness from love, Iago tries to rationalise the love out of lust. I think French puts that very eloquently. However, misogynistic cultures, because they need the women they despise, always contain a safety pocket. They open a very narrow gate through which pass those women considered purified from taint and thus elevated put on a pedestal of purity. Othello, Cassio, and the play itself exalt one woman, Desdemona, as being above the common run. Cassio describes Desdemona in terms that any mortal would have trouble living up to. She paragons description. She is so divine that even nature gives her homage. These two attitudes, one exalting, one degrading, neither able to deal with the reality toward women, and particularly toward Desdemona, are contrasted in Act 2, Scene 3, lines 15 to 29, in the dialogue of Cassio and Iago about Desdemona and sex. But they come into direct confrontation in Act 3, Scene 3. Cassio says lots of gentlemanly things. Iago does the reverse. And in this scene, it is Othello, not Iago, who associates vulnerability to feeling with bestiality. There are two kinds of women. One being superhuman, totally virtuous. Even Iago believes there are such things as virtuous women. See Act 2, Scene 3, Lines 360 to 61, and Act 4, Scene 1, Lines 46 to 47. The other kind is a dissembler, a deceiver, because of sexuality. She is thus subhuman, bestial, capable of any degradation, and the two kinds are mutually exclusive. One can cross into the subhuman camp at any time, but once in it, one can never return. So Othello, perceiving taint in Desdemona for the first time, is deeply shaken. Her later frightened deception about the handkerchief will clinch the case against her. Anya Lumba, Othello and the Racial Question There are two common threads in Brabantio's, Iago's and Othello's lines. First, that this match between Desdemona and Othello is unusual, unnatural and therefore especially fragile. And second, that women are inconstant and deceitful. Whether Othello imbibes these beliefs from Iago, or Iago only plays upon what Othello already believes, the point is that for all of them, male jealousy hinges upon racial difference as well as 
upon female infidelity. Italian and especially Venetian women were reputed to be particularly licentious. Iago tells Othello, in Venice they do let God see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to leave it undone, but keep it unknown. Contemporary writings suggested that Italian women were very lewd and wicked, for even in the ancient city of Rome, there are many thousands of lewd women living that pay monthly unto the Pope for the sinful use of their wicked bodies. This brings us back to some of our socio-historic context material from episode one. Venice was repeatedly pictured as a city full of whores, and it was often personified as one. Link here to that episode one socio-historic information, should you want it at this point. Right, we have looked at critical opinions on gender and women of varying periods and racial themes of varying periods. Let's take a look here at whether Othello is a tragic hero. A key feature of Aristotle's definition of tragedy is that the tragic hero be a man not preeminently virtuous and just, whose misfortune, however, is brought upon him not by vice, not by evil quality, but by some error of judgment. Let's pit Levis against Bradley. Who do you find more persuasive? F.R. Levis. According to the version of Othello elaborated by Bradley, the tragedy is the undoing of the noble Moor by the devilish cunning of Iago. Othello we are to see as a nearly faultless hero, according to Bradley, whose strength and virtue are turned against him. Othello and Desdemona, so far as their fate depended on their characters, their personality traits, and untampered with mutual relations, had every ground for expecting the happiness that romantic courtship had promised. It was external evil, Iago, the malice of the demi-devil, the half-devil, that turned a happy story of romantic love into a tragedy. This is to sentimentalise Shakespeare's tragedy and to displace its centre. It is as extraordinary a history of triumphant sentimental perversity as literary history can show. It is the vindication of Othello's perfect nobility that Bradley is preoccupied with, and we are to see the immediate surrender to Iago as part of that nobility. But to make absolute trust in Iago, trust at Desdemona's expense, a manifestation of perfect nobility is, even if we ignore what it makes of Desdemona, to make Iago a very remarkable person indeed. And it is plain that what we should see in Iago's prompt success is not so much Iago's diabolic intellect as Othello's readiness to respond. I find myself very aligned with Levis here. I am compelled and persuaded by this interpretation. Iago's power, in fact, in the temptation scene, is that he represents something that is in Othello, the husband of Desdemona. The traitor is within the gates. Could we link this up with McAvoy as well? As for the justice of this view, that Othello yields with extraordinary promptness to suggestion, with such promptness as to make it plain that the mind that undoes him is not Iago's but his own, it does not seem to need arguing. It's plain, then, 
that his love is composed very largely of ignorance of self as well as of ignorance of her. However nobly he may feel about it, it isn't altogether what he, and Bradley with him, thinks it is. It may be love, but it can only be in an oddly qualified sense love of her. It must be much more a matter of self-regarding satisfactions, pride, hubris, sensual possessiveness, appetite, love of loving, that's the thing I'm really compelled by and that I think is a subtle nuanced interpretation, than he suspects. Contemplating the spectacle of himself, Othello is overcome with the pathos of it. But this is not the part to die in. Drawing himself proudly up, he speaks his last words as the stern fighting man who has done the state some service. It is a superb coup de théâtre. As, with that double force, a coup de théâtre, it is a peculiarly right ending to the tragedy. He asserts himself, rather than making an anagnorisis realisation, perhaps. However, he is likely to remain, for many admirers, the entirely noble hero, object of a sympathy poignant and complete as he succumbs to the machinations of diabolic intellect. For me, not that I wish to prescribe what your perspective should be at all, I would be aligning myself with the subtle nuances of Levis here and drawing upon this idea of being a victim of, yes, as, as Bradley puts it, a, a, an initially noble victim of Iago's machinations, but this wonderfully subtle idea that Iago draws out uh, the enemy within the gates, some self-referential racism already within him. We retain, therefore, some sympathy, but that goes hand in hand, let's refine that position, with our frustrations as an audience. You've every subjective right to disagree with me and evidence, that's the important thing for the exam, your contrary interpretation. Or just refine it. It doesn't have to be outright disagreement or counter-argument. Bradley then would have Othello be the noble tragic hero. Levis argues that he has a lack of self-awareness that means that he lacks anagnorisis. He is the victim of Iago's machinations. As Sean McAvoy puts it, we, the audience, are made complicit in Iago's plot. Most critics and audiences have accepted that Othello is the hero of the play and that he is tragic. However, in Shakespeare is Hard But So Is Life, critic Fintan O'Toole argues that Othello doesn't deserve the title hero, let alone the tragic hero. Read the following extract from his argument. Do you find it convincing? Share your evidence and reasoning. If you look at the character of Othello in isolation, and in particular if you look at him through the notion of the tragic flaw, the personality trait, he is not, for all his facility with words, very bright. He can talk up a storm, but he's not so much for thinking. He's a bit thick, is he stupid? His tragic flaw is jealousy, and he carries it around like a crutch, just waiting for someone to kick it from under him. He's manipulated by Iago, a man he didn't even trust enough in the first place to make him his lieutenant, without ever attempting to ascertain facts himself. Suspecting his wife, he fails to confront her with her supposed infidelity, 
or even to question her alleged lover, or to ask any of the other people who could tell what's going on. Cassio says at the end, I never gave you cause, and your, uh, Othello acknowledges if he'd only asked. He's driven demented by a handkerchief. He's not tragic, he's merely pathetic. More importantly, and that's pathetic in the modern sense, not pathos as in sympathy. More importantly, Othello simply cannot be considered in isolation from Iago. There is no Othello without Iago. It is Iago who draws out his inner fears and longings, who makes him the character that we see and hear. And the tragedy is not just Othello's. It is also Iago's. Iago is as much a tragic figure as any of Shakespeare's protagonists, as much caught between one world and another, one way of thinking and another. If Iago were given another speech or two at the end of the play, the title could be changed from Othello to Iago, for everything else makes Iago fit for the role of protagonist. He has the soliloquies. He is the one who most reveals himself to the audience. He is the most active character in the play. To see the play as being about a tragic hero called Othello is absurd. And Othello, anyway, is not a tragic hero in any classical sense. In the first place, he is not a king or prince or ruler. This is where I might refute um, Fintan O'Toole to an extent. I, I really don't think we need to apply these Aristotelian principles quite so strictly, but O'Toole here is doing it to be facetious. And because of this, his personal tragedy does not involve the tearing apart of the state or the order of nature or universe because white society at the time might just think, oh, inevitable, black. On the contrary, he's a servant. The world will not be corrupted by his misdeeds, and we, as an audience, do not feel there is anything necessary or significant, never mind inevitable, about his death. On the contrary, it is an adjunct to a terrible mistake, an afterthought to an error. And because the whole world has not been involved in his tragedy, because it is so intensely personal, the tragedy of a victim rather than an active controller of other people's lives, there is no need to restore the social and political order in the end. It has not been destroyed. The white is still in power. He argues there the sympathy, but that, uh, or rather, that there there is a, a tragic victim, uh, but that sympathy can go hand in hand with that, without being a tragic hero who experiences anagnorisis. So I've spoken about pitting critics against one another. It's very straightforward and easy to take a contemporary critic like Lumba or Ryan on racial issues in a contemporary sense and pit them against the overt racism of somebody like John Quincy Adams. But perhaps we need to just make sure that we're not talking about pitting one against the other quite so dichotomous a way as that. Thinking in the same way that I had you thinking about pitting Mendez's reading of Desdemona against... Um, uh, Herod's uh, more uh, disparaging or derogatory reading of Desdemona. If you think about some of the criticism we've looked at in the last couple of slides, can you, yes, pit against one another, but in order to be aiming for A and A star responses that are truly evaluative, you are asserting your position amongst multiple possible interpretations. So engage with the subtly nuanced differences between the readings of O'Toole, Leavis, 
Bradley, Sean McAvoy, that kind of nuanced difference. Now, more's the pity that it wouldn't be reasonable for me to publish big, long essays or chapters of more extended criticism to pitch to challenge you like undergraduate university level study would be. But I have just pulled out here a few of what I consider to be key quotations from O'Toole's Is a Fellow Stupid chapter of Shakespeare is Hard But So Is Life. His tragic flaw is jealousy. He is manipulated by Iago, a man he didn't even trust enough in the first place to make him his lieutenant, without ever attempting to ascertain himself the facts. The dismissal of Cassio. He fails to confront her with her supposed infidelity. Are we, as an audience, frustrated? Is this a symptom of his racial isolation? The square brackets there are my additions. There is no Othello without Iago. I know I'm repeating myself, but these were what I took to be the key points. It is Iago who draws out his inner fears and longings. The title could be changed from Othello to Iago. He has the soliloquies. He's the one who reveals himself the most to the audience. You can think about the patterns revealing themes yet refused to speak to characters at the end. He is the most active character in the play. Othello, for a hero, is strikingly passive. You might take that point on and show some of his violent outbursts. And because the whole world has not been involved in his tragedy, he, Black, is still an other in Venetian society, because it is so intensely personal, the tragedy of a victim rather than an active controller of people's lives, there is no need to restore social order. Could you take this on? Do you consider him a victim or are you frustrated that he's the, the engineer of his own fate? Venice, vigorous capitalism, racial and religious melting pot, Christian civilization of the West meets Islamic infidels of the East. Venice is a byword for exotic vices and unbridled passions, a place where black and white are no longer opposites. That last one seems a bit random there. It doesn't really fit, but key things that I took from O'Toole. To refine that a little, the argument being made there is that because the victim is black, a white audience is potentially less moved. Othello, sex, race and suggestibility has been lifted from uh, The Essential Guide to Shakespeare, The Arden Guide to Text and Interpretation of 2013, edited by Bickley and Stevens. The audience is encouraged to place blame not on the black outsider, but on the white majority whose values have corrupted him. Yargo's locker room vernacular, there's something else that I've lifted and forgotten to cite from Bickley and Stevens, sexual innuendos, place him squarely in the military world, ensuring that all take him for the blunt soldier, never stopping to question what might lie beneath his misogynistic, plain-speaking exterior. Concepts of lust rather than love, reducing relationships to lust. What seems to lurk beneath this suppression of female agency, however, is a strong fear of the uncontrollability of women's sexuality. And it is this fear that Iago plays on in intimate conversations with Othello. Uh, Jonathan Dollimore, Professor Jonathan Dollimore, uh, writing at the time in 2003 as a professor of literature at the University of York, uh, which means he must be a genius, given that's my alma mater. Uh, Othello, a tragedy of racism, xenophobia and misogyny.
Dollimore discusses how Othello views himself by older, arguably outdated parameters of masculinity, warriorship, in a new world of trade. He's valued as a warrior, but subservient to white superiors in the trade world of mercantile Venice. A misogynistic conception of women is fused with a racist one of Othello and a xenophobic one about who Desdemona should naturally desire. And somewhere inside himself, Othello perhaps agrees you could use Dollymore here alongside Levis' idea of the traitor within the gates, self-referential racism and McAvoy. And if he does, it may be because he has come to identify unconditionally with the society he serves. Desdemona's desire for Othello and his for her are both inflected with racial idealisations. Another thing that I've stolen from somebody without citing them properly, um, idealising each other, Othello and Desdemona, as others that are exotic, is Dolimore's idea. Each romanticises the difference of the other as a way of escaping the limitations of their own lives. Additionally, Iago can't help imagining the sexual union of Othello and Desdemona, even whilst disgusted by it. Bonnegria's The Enemy Within, reading Othello, perhaps evokes the idea of Levis's The Enemy is Within the Gates, self-referential racism on Othello's part that Iago draws out of his mind. Once again, Iago tells us he hates Othello, but we already know that. That never changes. In a play, a character who never changes, who is not dynamic, no matter how powerful that character is, is not the main focus. It is Othello who is changing. What we want to see now is whether Othello and Desdemona can survive Iago's hate. Jealousy is destroying Othello. It is this trait of his nature, the jealousy, that undermines his life. Not racism, although that plays a part. Not the unmotivated hatred of Iago, though that's involved too. It is that which is part of man himself. Um, Joe Caird here, Iago on the couch, psychoanalysis, applies a bit of Freud, perhaps, to the play. Um, I am working to the assumption that Joe spelt that way is a Joanne, is a woman. Uh, not that it's really that relevant. Um, this is a queer theory criticism that is attempting to counter a heteronormative interpretation of the play and interpret the play as demonstrating some sort of latent or repressed homosexuality. It's not something that I am at all convinced by myself, um, but perhaps if you do it with subtlety, it might be something that you look to refute. Or you could agree with it if you so wish, but that's going to be pretty undergraduate to do. Is it useful to psychoanalyse fictional characters? Terry Hans believes it is. Here, Joe Caird takes a closer look. As Hans sees it, Othello and Iago have clearly been together a very long time. He's been honest Iago to Othello and pretty much everybody else, and it's only once the general has announced his intention to marry that Iago begins his campaign to pass on his own chaos to somebody else. Repressed homosexuality. We see this process in action in Iago on the couch, as David Bell attributes Iago's sociopathy to his repressed homosexual feelings for Othello. According to Freud, Bell explains, 
we are all naturally bisexual. Uh, Freud talks about sexuality being on a spectrum of extents. And it's only when these desires are repressed rather than accepted by the conscious mind that the trouble arises. Yargo can so quickly turn against the man he's willingly served all these years because he is harbouring unconscious turmoil as a result of repressed homosexual urges for the more. It is only when Othello and Desdemona marry that this turmoil rears its head. This, of course, is not Iago's motivation for doing what he does, but this type of analysis is undoubtedly helpful when it comes to understanding what makes Iago tick and untangling the many justifications he gives for his actions. As Hans sees it, Iago is able to lead Othello to his downfall because he recognises the potential for excessive sexual jealousy in the general and is skillful enough to exploit it. Is he jealous of Othello's um, marriage to Desdemona? Attracted to the Moor? Uh, in Cynthia's On Capitano Moro, the equivalent character is attracted to Desdemona and that's his motive. Or is it more likely here uh, a contemporary time of racism whereby he thinks it's unnatural um, for the two to be together? He cites jealousy of his wife's alleged cuckoldry of him with Othello and he hasn't had a promotion. Those things strike me as more compelling. OK. Uh, that brings us to the end of episode eight. I hope this takes us through ways that we are not simply ignoring critics altogether. Because if you do that, your grade for this question will be an E, however good your modern play in this exam is. If you are quoting critics and citing them just to show your recall, you are only on a D grade at best. If you are quoting them and engaging with them by bringing in evidence from the play for why you agree and taking that to contrasts and refuting, then you are getting into C and moving toward B. If you're starting to refine and explore that position, you should be developing through B. If you are able then to evaluate those critics either because of their AO3 socio-historic concepts or by pitting one against the other and pulling out evidence from elsewhere in the play that shows your engagement with elsewhere or that pits critics against one another and gives evidence to exemplify which you are more or less convinced by then you are sustaining an evaluation that should be moving into A and A star territory. As ever, if you've stuck this far, this must now be getting into the really meaningful nitty gritty and helpful to you in aiming for that A star. Please reward me with a like and a subscription and hitting the notification for next time's episode which will be more generically bringing exam preparation together. Thank you and see you next time.